It's so funny in quarantine. I feel like a lot of people revisited or discovered yeah. the show yeah. for the yeah. first time. Big time, big time. I, I found that like I'm getting recognized more with a mask and sunglasses on than ever before with <laughs> no mask or sunglasses on. Welcome to episode two of Entertainment Weekly's Binge of the Vampire Diaries. I'm Sam Heifel, and I'm joined by executive producer Julie Pleck and series stars Nina Dobrev and Paul Wesley to talk all things season two, one of my favorite top two seasons, one of my favorite seasons for sure. Um, As I said with the first episode, we will stick mostly to season two, but this is there is a series wide spoiler alert on every episode of this podcast If we decide to spoil the ending, it's going to happen. So I say watch the whole show before you come back and listen to any of these episodes. But as we're getting into it, Nina, you were sort of just saying off camera, like, do you all remember specific seasons of The Vampire Diaries? How does that work in your mind? (laughs) It kind of feels like one long episode that lasted (laughs) eight years. As we were prepping for this interview, I actually had to Google YouTube videos of recaps of season two to refresh my memory to make sure that like, because I thought we were only sticking to season two. So I was like, hey, to make sure I don't say anything from season three or in season one. So I, so Paul, if you don't remember, here's a general (laughs) recap. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert. I don't remember. (laughs) By the way, this is like the perfect example of like their two actor processes like Nina would have a binder full of notes and like and like maps and charts for everything she's supposed to do and Paul would be in the hair and makeup room at call being like what are we shooting today (laughs) (laughs) I mean don't don't get me wrong I'm still a consummate professional but yeah I'm a little bit more no but it's funny because I I do need that recap Nina but for me from like a speaking of like actors processes like from like a narcissistic actor perspective when you say like do you remember season two for me i look at it like what did i look at like there's bc and and ad before christ and after death for me it's before ripper it's br and ar after Ah. ripper so i all i know is that like season two i was still a good guy and then towards the end i started getting so that for me that's the only like gauge i have of time a a good guy and henceforth yeah that's it yeah Yeah. exactly Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. so nina what does happen in season two what's the yeah um so uh catherine catherine returns and at the end of season one uh catherine kills anders character which was uh, Uncle John. Uh, John, yeah, um, dad, dad, Uncle John, dad. and dad, <laughs> dad, dad, Jay. daddy. <laughs> um, and so Catherine returns and wreaks havoc, and then Tyler Lockwood's cousin or brother, what was he? Brother, cousin, <gasps> Mason cousin. Lockwood, yeah, Mason, oh, yeah. Taylor, yeah. Look. great, <laughs> great looking guy. <laughs> Taylor <laughs> Kinney <laughs> arrives, and he, um, he's looking for the moonstone because he wants to activate some sort of werewolf something or another. And then the originals are introduced and they, and Klaus is a hybrid vampire werewolf who then has to, he wants to break a, some sort of a curse and either become full werewolf or full. Well, I don't remember this part. Full hybrid. Full Sun and oh. curse. Okay. Yes. It's all very blurry. I, I, <laughs> I remember though. like at the time we were shooting it being confused and being really like, trying to stay <laughs> on track. <laughs> it sounds for me like I remember when the season that the originals got introduced was one of my favorite seasons. Mm-hmm. That's I do remember that. So this must be it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's it. Your favorite season. Yeah. Well, I do want to start with, because season two kicks off with Catherine in modern day. Obviously, at that point, Nina, you played her in flashbacks, but this was like the big Catherine's in it now moment. And Julie and Kevin talked about in episode one, like they at the very beginning weren't fully sure if you were going to play both characters. So like, what was kind of your introduction to, oh no, like I'm doing double duty on the show and I have to craft this entire other character? They didn't tell me until like day of almost, I feel like <laughs> for the same reason, they weren't sure. So they, they definitely weren't going to tell me. Um, but I feel like right before that episode, was it episode six of season one, Julie, the lost 
boys, lost yeah. girls. Yeah. She was introduced. So then they gave me a heads up and then, but it was, it was gradual. Like the first episode was just like a couple flashbacks and then they introduced her more and more. So I got to figure her out over the first season. And then by season two, once she was like back in, in, in the flesh and she was in a lot more of the episode, it, it was, it was crazy. The schedule wise shooting both of the, the roles, having to do Elena and Catherine and shooting scenes with myself at times um, was a wild learning experience, but, um, but really fun too. Cause I got to play two wildly different characters and, and play around and, and do and say things that I would, especially at the time, never dare think and say out loud. Cause I was like a self-proclaimed good girl when I got this show and then slowly <laughs> <laughs> became more evil as I embodied Catherine. <laughs> I learned a lot from her. She was... <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of grew up and got more confident with, with, with the writing. It was, it was, it was pretty interesting. Julie, what was it like for you all to, I mean, Catherine is one of the greatest villains, if not the greatest villain of the Vampire Diaries. What was it like? You'd written her in flashback, to, but to kind of write and introduce this character, what did you guys feel like she kind of added to the the modern day mix of it all? Well, it it really was, um, in a lot of ways, she was like the, the Lady Damon, you know? She always had the snark, the witty comeback, the one-liner, you know, um, that's what we were talking about the first episode. That's um, sounds like the beginning of a love story, not the end of one, you know, hate is love turned inside out and all those great things. Um, so it, it, writing her was always so fun because she was so unfettered and wild and could, and could say whatever she wanted and be that big and bold. But I just remember, I mean, just the logistics of that season, because, you know, when you shoot a scene with, Nina playing Elena and Catherine, you're shooting the scene with Nina playing Elena and a, and a stand in, um, in, in standing in the place and, and acting against Nina. And then you have to shoot the whole scene all over again with Nina in the other role. And so everything you're shooting twice. And we didn't really think of that <laughs> <laughs> when we started writing the show. Um, it didn't, totally occur to us that it would basically double the shooting time of every scene. Um, and so it got to the point where Nina was just like, had been working so hard and was so beaten down that we moving forward had to just write less Catherine, um, okay. Catherine Elena, because it was just too, it was just too much. It was like, you know, all day, every day. I remember carrying around two separate scripts, one for each character because I had to like break down what Elena was going through in that episode and what her intentions were. And then having a separate script for what Catherine wanted out of every scene and every circumstance. And then even the, the physicalities, like I had to kind of draw out and map out like what I would do as each character so that I could react as the other person. Like if Elena rolled her eyes, I'd have to make sure Catherine clocked it. Or if Catherine said something bitchy, then Elena would have to also react to that. So I remember it like being very meticulous about those specific things. It was, it was really challenging, but really fun. And like Julie mentioned, exhausting at times <laughs> to have to <laughs> was it Klaus? that was energy. It, Klaus was the episode where she basically is talking to Catherine inside the tomb. And so Catherine's like all dried out on one side. And then I think Elena's that's Katarina, in. isn't it? Katarina. Thank you. Yeah. Katarina. Yeah. That's right. Class was 19. Um, the uh, just, I mean, there's like probably 20 pages of dialogue of the two of them just talking. Stefan, now you're here. I brought you some things. You came to bribe me. What is it that you want? I want you to tell me about Klaus. Mm. You've been busy. Who was your, who was, we, um, she started as a stand-in and was just reading lines, but she was so good that Brittany. like we, yes, Brittany, um, she was, she was really good and like gave you what you needed. So you're actually acting against somebody as opposed to just like a random person. Yeah. She was really good to work with, especially cause I, I would give her the other scripts that I had and I would do it once the way I kind of wanted to do it. And then she was really good at mimicking and, and redoing it so that it was still because then later if she had 
what because you'd you still see the back of her head and her body language. So if she did something that I would have to match to what she did if it wasn't what we planned together. So there was a lot of planning involved. And uh, as, as stupid as it is, just the hair and makeup time too to switch over mm-hmm. from each character. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. What did you guys do in the hour that it took to switch over? Like, did you film something else to save the we, time? Yeah, we would always schedule it. So it was either like happening over like breaking you for an early lunch or, you know, a small scene that we could fit in the middle. Because I think it was, yeah, it was a full hour to like, or maybe even an hour and 45 to like take you all down and then and then build you back up. It's so, it's so because, funny, like hearing all this, like it, I, it's, I don't know. I, I, it's all in the back of my brain, like in my subconscious <laughs> and now hearing all of this, like the, the switch over time, Brittany reading off camera, this, and then you with the binders, like I have vivid memories of all of this that I haven't actually thought about in 10 years. You know, <laughs> I'm going down this like visceral memory, <laughs> and, like imagining everything. It's so wild. I'm just going to continue mm-hmm. listening. <laughs> well, I do. I told Julie before we started, um, we have to touch on Masquerade because A, it's one of the best episodes of the series. But for you two, it was also, that was the like Catherine, Damon, Stefan fight scene, which like, I feel like you probably remember shooting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was, by the way, I'll just, that was that particular scene I don't remember. Everybody was so mad at each other. I don't remember why, but also <laughs> it was a Friday night and we were on Covington. stage. Well, the, 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 um, the one where you're like throwing stakes at each other in the hotel room was a stage piece. Oh, you're right. And I uh, was, I, I wasn't in that. Was I? Yeah. You yeah, were you in that were. too. It was the two me? brothers against Catherine. Uh, yeah. It was like a, a, no, it was like the Lockwood mansion, the okay. Lockwood mansion, like tea room, but we built it. Oh, okay. um, I don't, I don't know why I don't remember this scene. But the way production is supposed to work is that you like, you start early on a Monday at like seven o'clock in the morning. And then by the time you get to Friday, you know, you might have a night shoot outside. So you want to be like a, a later call. And sometimes you have really late calls. The worst thing you can do for anybody is what we did. Which I don't even know how, why it happened that way, but we were on the stage on a Friday, but like with a five o'clock call. So you're not PM. even outside. There's no, yeah, PM. There's no reason to be like shooting 5 PM to 7 AM, except for just the schedule happened to fall that way. Oh. And that scene took so long. And I think we wrapped oh. at like eight o'clock in the morning. Like, oh I think we God. were, I think we watched the sun come up and it was terrible. And everyone is in a bad mood and everyone was all pissed off at each other. It, it, we, we didn't watch the sun come up. We, we left work and drove home when the sun was coming. Up. <laughs> right. And then tried to fall asleep at 9am. Yeah. It's so, I, I really believe like firmly in my heart that shows would be so much better in terms of just like longevity, actor happiness, quality, everything. Not that Vampire Diaries season one and two were amazing quality, but I do think we got burned out. I think everyone should shoot like three weeks on and then one week off. I think it yeah. would be the solution to everything. Um, I agree. I, especially in 22 a year, you know? I, I just, oh. yeah. Anyway, it has nothing to do with this podcast. It's just, <laughs> it's just a lot of episodes. 22 episodes is a lot to shoot a lot to write a lot it's just crazy yeah. yeah we were i remember that day too julie that was like one that was kind of one of my breaking points of exhaustion was that specific episode there was so yeah. much catherine and those all those night shoots and, and I, I think i was like 22 years old at the time yeah you were I, very young and, and still then was like so exhausted to the core of my being i don't think i could do that now at 32 right. Wow, yeah, right. so old. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> so old. But the, the, just circling back on the final thing on Catherine, that really like is when she clicked for me. Um, I mean, she was epic from jump from the jump. But like, it, I think it was episode four. It was Rob Hardy's episode, and it was the first time we flashed back again in the season in season two. And I don't even remember what her story was in that episode. That directly, but I remember the end of the episode when Catherine and there's a Sarah Bareilles playing song playing and Catherine is like out on a dirt road and she's just like 
you know, staring up and longingly for something and you realize like this is a character that wants something, that needs something emotionally. Like she is being driven by a deeply personal want here. And that sort of became the rule on the show that if you have a villain, the villain has to be, and we've talked about this a lot, the villain has to be the hero of their own story. And not just in like that, you know, I like to be a bad person chasing power, but in like, I have lost a love that I must avenge, or I am doing this for my child or whatever, like something that um, is just a deeply personal rooting interest for them. And so that's the moment where I fell in love with Catherine as a hero of her own story. Just, I had so much empathy for her in that moment. That has a lot to do with, we called him out in the last episode, but Josh Butler, the editor, um, just knew how to find the song and get, you know, just get that moment. And that was one of my favorite music moments on the show. Well, I'm, I'm just going to keep calling out scenes and see what it brings up. But season two, and it is because of Catherine, has what I consider maybe the most, one of the most heartbreaking breakup scenes in the history of the Vampire Diaries when oh. Jenna stabs herself and Stefan and Elena break up and Paul, you like destroyed me. I'm scared to ask about this. You're a meme. That's a meme. You're cry face. You are a meme. meme. I know. It's not as bad as James Vanderbeek's. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that scene. Uh, the, no, the person who was directing that was um, Baring. Um, yeah, John Baring, and I just remember, um, you know, I, I, he's, he's a, he's a director um, who likes to do lots of takes, like lots, <laughs> like, like, like some, sometimes like 10, 12, you know, 14, which is very unheard of in television, frankly, network television, there's a schedule and you don't really do that many takes. I don't know if we did that many, but I remember doing like at least four that were like pretty good, you know? But I also like, you know, um, you know, was dealing with a couple things in my personal life. So I was kind of like, didn't really want to go to dark places because I was like trying to keep my head above water uh, yeah. in, in real life, frankly. Um, and so Baring kept pushing me. Maybe I don't, sorry, I certainly didn't confide in him but uh, maybe he sensed I was going through something. And so he really wanted that on screen. And I remember just getting a little bit angry at him, uh, even though it was his job and sure. that I, I would do the same as a director. And that's what you're supposed to do. That's when you're creating a film or television, the whole point of it is to be honest and pure. Otherwise, what the hell is the point? I was still a young actor and I kind of was still like sort of guarding my feelings. And I just remember being like, all right, uh, F it. I'm not going to curse. I feel like this is PG. F it. I'll do it. I'll just go. I'll go to my personal place. Did it. <laughs> so that, that crying and all that kind of, that whole breakup was, um, you know, my own dealing with my own stuff essentially on screen exploited, which is what acting is. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, I remember after we shot it, I was like, Eh, a little relieved, but then also a little bit angry that he, that we like, that I had to deal with that. And then I had to go home and deal with that. But at the end of the day, it's on screen. It works so great for the role, for the, uh, the scene. And I would do it again in a heartbeat because, you know, that's what, that's what all the great actors do. So, Hey, Greggy, no, um, that's my dog. Um, he doesn't want, he doesn't want me to go to the dark place. <laughs> worried about me. Oh, that's such a good, I feel like, wait, Paul, now that we have you, because this was a question I had for Julie and Kevin in season one of, this was my favorite answer to this, because at the end of the pilot, when Stefan comes to like Elena's front door to check on her, and then she invites him in, like it's the very end of the pilot, you're like on the verge of tears. So of course I'm talking to Julie and Kevin and I'm like, it was such an amazing choice from Paul. And they're like, we're pretty sure it was so cold. His eyes were watering. <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember? Um, it's like vague memory of you being like, I can't, bro, I can't get my eyes to stop watering. <laughs> I don't know if I made it up. I don't know if I made it up. Um, yeah, so to answer your question, I don't know if those were, that was tears or me just, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I will, I will continue thinking it was a fantastic Paul acting. Thank you. I prefer you to think that. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
Um, okay, well, let's talk about the the entrance of the originals, which obviously starts with Elijah, which, Julie, you all have talked about this a lot, but so he was supposed to die, die at the end of that episode, right? Yeah, I uh, I think originally when we when we wrote it, we were, you know, the plan was to kill him. And then we thought, well, actually, we could use this villain as a bridge villain until we introduced Klaus. And so we just started keeping him as in the story so that we were just kind of filling time because we didn't want to have the Klaus reveal until the end of the season. He was scripted to really truly just be um, like a mid-season little mini arc villain. And then he was Daniel and everything changed. <laughs> that happened a lot, didn't it? Where like people would come in for a quick little whatever and then you guys would fall in love with them and write a whole spinoff series for them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it did. I mean, he's certainly, he's certainly the, uh, the one that like made the most impact. I think just, to, he was mm. so precise and, and had made such a choice about who this character was going to be. And it was just so delightful. To whom it may concern, you're making a great mistake. If you think that you can beat me, you can't. I remember the day he had that big thing in his, um, yeah. Like a, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a photo of him with that because I've known Daniel for years and I knew Daniel from Vancouver from like a decade prior. I was doing a pilot. It was a TV series called Wolf Lake for CBS. And I remember like meeting Daniel through friends and we got on, we stayed in touch. So then sure enough, he showed up 10 years later. And I just remember he has a presence for sure. Like I definitely remember him walking in with the suit and you know, like, oh, this is cool. This is going to be like an interesting character. Um, and then boom, <laughs> then he got his own spinoff. <laughs> so but but uh, Paul can take credit, partial credit for Joseph Morgan. You can tell that. Yeah. Story also. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't, I get intuitions about people, you know, like I can just sort of sense. And I remember Joseph Morgan, I met him just socially through, he was dating a very good friend of mine and I met him and I just had a conversation with him. I didn't even ask him about acting. Like, you know, it was just like a conversation. And then I remember thinking, oh, he's an interesting guy. There's something about him that's kind of, you. I don't know why, but I think this guy's talented. I don't know why. I just had that kind of intuition. And I was having, we were all having dinner and Julie was telling me we need to ca ca cast this villain essentially. And we're having a hard time. And I just remember being like, you know what? Check out this guy. I had a conversation with him and I think he might be an interesting choice. And you said, okay, cool. I'll, I'll send an email to casting. I didn't think anything was going to come from uh, come of it, but you actually did send the email to casting and you guys yeah. met with him. And did he read for it? Yeah, he read. Yeah. yeah he put and, himself on tape. Okay. That's from, what he uh, okay, put himself on tape. Yeah. Okay. And then he got the part. So he I, I, part. I, I am, I mean, I, obviously he got himself the part, but I don't know if he would have necessarily auditioned for it if it weren't for me. Yeah, I don't know. I would actually, yeah. funnily enough, have to ask Leslie and Greg how that went down. But I remember that conversation so vividly. No. Um, Me too. And, and 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 then you being later, and I, you know, when you heard Joe got cast, you're like, oh my god, that was my idea. I'm like, yeah, it was your idea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked out. It worked yeah. out. I mean, in an extraordinary way. Yeah, yeah. I really. feel like that happened a lot with with Paul, like suggesting people and them getting on the show. And I remember being so deeply offended because I was like, Oh, I want to suggest some people. And then I would like suggest people, but no one would ever get cast. So you know, you know who else, <laughs> either you, know you guys who? didn't care about my opinion or my friends weren't talented. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure which one it is. I finally got my, my moment though. It took me eight years, but, um, one day, remember I suggested the song. I like sent you a song truly. Yes, <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> you, in the she, finale, we were driving home, yeah. Yeah, in the finale of Vampire Diaries, the final, final episode, um, there was this song. I don't know why. I, I just like connected to it and I sent it to, to Julie. And I was like, I don't know. I, I like this. I don't know if it'll fit or whatever, but just putting it on your radar. It hadn't even come out yet. It was like a friend's demo, uh, chords demo. It's called Hold On. And I don't even think you, you, you sort of, I don't know if you listened to it, but you just forwarded the email to the sound guy, right? Or the music yeah. composer. Basically, I, I, I heard the song because you were trying to play play it in the car. And I feel like I feel like it kept, I was trying to play it and it kept resetting because it, it, it was a Dropbox file. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a music file. So it, on the iPhone, if you're playing a Dropbox music file and if your phone goes to sleep, 
it starts the whole song all over again. So I couldn't get through the song, but I loved it. So yeah, just in that moment, just so I wouldn't forget, I sent it to our editor and our producer, Tony Solomons. And then I get home, this is weeks later, and I'm going to watch my director's cut of the episode for the first time. And I get to that scene, and that song, it's Court Over Street. Um, it's so beautiful. And I'm just sobbing. And I say to the editor, I said, where the, where'd you find that song? That moment is so perfect. And he's like, you sent it to me. And I said, oh, well, good. I will take full credit. But it's really Nina's credit. Well, it's Cord's credit. But. <laughs> yeah. Cord's the one that put all the work in. But I remember yeah. feeling like, like very proud that it's something made made the episode at some point <laughs> even though it was stupid and small and whatever but yeah seminar <laughs> yeah well let's get to the the end of season two I guess it's the penultimate episode technically oh, but like the yeah. whole season you're building to this enormous ceremony ritual whatever you want to call it Klaus wants to break the curse you guys are filming this there's there's fire everywhere it's this big epic thing what do you all remember about filming that moment oh you, you weren't remember? there oh yeah, yeah you were. He showed up at the yeah. end he showed up to try to save the day yeah Jenna the, dies. The circle. Oh my yes. god. Fire wait a minute. Wait a minute. Was this directed it's by quarry. um Summers? Summers. Yeah. Yeah. I just can oh. I'll, I'll be I'll be honest with you. And this was another night shoot. And I just remember being exhausted. You know, I, I, I don't mean to make this all about exhaustion, but the show was very important to, to, to me and to Nina and to Ian because it was such a success and we all loved it and believed in it. So it's not one of these things where you just do everything lightly. You take it very seriously. And I just remember being just I was dying I was just like I want this season to end because I'm putting so much into this you know and I just was tired I was just tired I just remember shooting and just being tired that's all I remember <laughs> I know that sounds so boring do you remember Nina like that was, it was yeah yeah especially by the time you get to the end of any season yeah. I think we all felt the same way at the end of every season because after shooting 22 hour long episodes, like, I don't know if people, maybe they do know that it takes between 10 to 13 days to shoot one episode. Mm -hmm. Um, we shoot nights for, I felt like 14 to 16 hour days on average. Cause if you include yeah. the travel time Absolutely. and the hair and makeup time and the actual 12 hour shooting day, plus the one hour lunch. So you're shooting 16 hours a day or working for 16 hours a day. And then, and then it's press. 10 months of yeah. shooting and then traveling for press on the weekends and doing things like, thank God. I and then you have to learn again. your Thank lines. God we did this when we were, yeah. You, and then once you get home, you go right, Paul, we have to like break down the scenes and work on everything. So that's another couple of hours. By the end of 10 months of doing this, you are so, so tired. And all I remember getting sick at the end of every season, like so sick because your body is just kind of holding on trying to to you're like tricking it into thinking it's fine and then as soon as you relax you I just crashed every year um but it was so like Paul's right we, we were so excited and and wanted to do the absolute very best that we could so we put every ounce of our energy into it we didn't want to disappoint the fans and we wanted to make sure that the episodes were the best television that they could possibly be and and that took a lot of energy and 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 our personal lives suffered as a result of it. But, <laughs> but when you're in your early 20s, in my case, like that was like, work was my life, you know? Same, I, yeah, I, same. I loved it. But that particular night was cold, I'm sure. I was yeah, also absolutely. sad because Sarah, Sarah was so sad to be leaving the show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that yeah. whole I forgot about time that. was just incredibly emotional. Like she yeah. had really she had really personalized the character being written off, which it was not about her at all. Um, mm -hmm. Sarah Canning is an extraordinary actress. I mean, she is going to be out working and out living us all. Um, but it really had hit her hard emotionally because she had made friends and she had, you know, a, a formed a relationship. And so there was, it, it wasn't like a party. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. like a countdown, a, a, a death countdown. That was just a real bummer of a time, but Boy, speaking of memes, you're a meme from that episode too, Nina, from the laying the rose at uh, at Uncle John's grave. 
um, with mm. the birdie song playing. There's a mm. birdie song. I, I don't know why I remember all the songs, but that one, again, is one of the top five music moments of the entire series. That's Skinny if Love. Not, if not the number one. Yeah, oh, Skinny Love. Oh, yeah, right. Um, oh, I remember that. And, and the letter that Uncle John writes you, which Mike Daniels wrote, um, like, in five minutes. <laughs> it's just, uh, that's just a great emotional payoff to the season, that episode. And then we had to figure out what the hell to do in the finale. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I do <laughs> like talking about the John moment though, because wasn't this Julie for a long time? Season two was when Elena was going to become a vampire kind of until you all came up with the John twist, right? You know, I, I don't remember. I knew that like we had really, and you actually might be able to refresh my memory because I remember we were trying to hold off and making her a vampire as long as humanly possible. But yeah. yeah, did we get ourselves into a bind where we thought we had to deliver on it earlier? Because that sounds like us. Just, <laughs> when did I turn into a vampire? End of three. season three. I remember oh, it was sure. at, it was in book two. So I re- just remember you talking about how like you would consider, but yeah, it was like when you figured out that John could save her life and she wouldn't have right. that, how she would come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was, oh God, I love, that's so funny. I love the, the last couple episodes of that season. I love the last day when they go up to the waterfall mm-hmm. and she says, I want to be a vampire, oh. Stefan. I mean, you guys were doing such beautiful work and we were like really like doing beautiful film work too. Like just always really wanting the show to look as good as it could, you know, and just be full of scope and all the, you know, cinematic magic. And um, that, that again, that's what makes it so hard is you're, you know, you're, you're pushing for excellence on every level and at 22 episodes, you just want to die at the end. <laughs> <laughs> you just want to die. There's just no fun. There's no, there's nothing good about it. <laughs> yeah. But then you create something that we're talking about 10 years later. So yeah, mm. that is the good Absolutely. It's so funny in quarantine. I feel like a lot of people revisited or discovered the show for the first time. Big time, big time. I I found that like I'm getting recognized more with a mask and sunglasses on than ever before with no (laughs) mask or sunglasses on. It's from the masquerade. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> because like people have been have been binging it all over again and people who didn't have time before because life was too busy have have good have been finding peace or or distraction in our yeah. show and so yeah. it's been it's 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 breathing a new life i feel like i know not not to be like cheesy about it but i totally second that like there was a moment where in the beginning uh, i was getting recognized a lot and then it kind of like oh, okay it subsided a little and i was like okay cool and then suddenly like in the last like year it's like crazy everyone has watched the show Um, And I'm like, what's going on? There must be a resurgence, but it's exactly, yeah, it's exactly that. People are discovering the show again. It's crazy. You know, there was an article that came out. It was the 15th most streamed show on Netflix in 2020, Mm -hmm. which is really, yeah, which is crazy. Um, And the show premiered, what, 10 years ago, you know what I mean? So that's pretty, pretty major. Longer. What's that? (laughs) 12 years ago. 12 years ago, shit. (laughs) God, really? Yeah, yeah you're right. Nine. Oh my wow. god! Wow, it's a long time. I you know. guys, oh my gosh! I just had like, I just had, you know, like the end of your life when your whole life is supposed to flash in front of your eyes. I'm literally, I'm remembering like Nina on the in Vancouver on the pilot sneaking off to go snowboarding when she was <laughs> supposed to. I remember, and, that I, I'm, <laughs> and I'm remembering like you guys on season three and the reckoning getting to a huge fight on set because you were some, you'd reached your like breaking point of exhaustion oh, I remember like that too. with each other mm-hmm. and like and I got calls from both of you I was in LA and, <laughs> and I didn't, one of you was like you're probably gonna hear from the other but like I just need to tell you that like that I just I'm this is the last straw <laughs> just, <laughs> and then like and then years later you're like best friends hanging out all the time traveling together like it's just mm-hmm. such a great arc <laughs> so funny i remember um, hanging out when i was when we were doing the pilot in vancouver um i remember hanging out with ariel kebel who would late who was shooting a pilot a different pilot all at the sutton place and i knew her from uh my girlfriend at the time and i just remember like who would have thought that later she would get on the show and she'd become this fan favorite you know playing Stefan's best friend or whatever it's so funny Oh my God. The show would have been so different if it aired in, uh, 
it shot in Vancouver too. It would have been a complete yeah. vibe. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Well everybody was so cold. It would have been so cold. Atlanta. It would yeah. have been so wet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were cold, yeah. plenty cold anyway. I know, but we would have been more consistently cold for 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 longer periods. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just like the chill in our bones. We we at least had we had like three or four months of cold and then a whole bunch of of sweating like a lot of a lot of fans on set not not like fans as in viewers but fans <laughs> as in to cool us down because hot lana is a real thing in the summer yeah when was your 21st birthday was that season two or season one season one okay and i was 20 when we did the pilot <laughs> yeah that was wild Nina Nina's known know. for her generosity of um, of adventure, and like so, if she wants to go have one, she will make you come along with her. And but she'll like set the whole thing up. So for her twenty first birthday, she just got completely hooked up in Vegas, and took the entire cast, and then also Kevin and I flew in, and Breslau I think flew in from L A. And we had a whole Vegas weekend for Nina's birthday. <laughs> that's where <laughs> Nina, insane. Nina, that's where our epic hair photo is. Where oh, that's right in the, suite. That was in the suite. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. was especially wild because we like we shot what, what we mentioned at the beginning of the episode of this episode. Um, we shot a Friday day, which is we had like a 5 p.m. call and we wrapped on Friday and then wrapped at like 7 a.m. on Saturday. And the whole cast like got in the car, we drove to the airport and got on like a 9.30 a.m. flight, flew to Vegas, still having not slept from the shoot, landed, went to a, um, I think an indoor skydiving place, <laughs> did that, went to the room, had dinner, went out, got crazy on Saturday night, celebrated, then got on a plane. A pretty, I'm pretty sure most of us didn't sleep Saturday night either. Sunday morning, we all got on a plane with either zero or two hours of sleep, landed in, in back in Atlanta that night, and then had to be on set at 5 a.m. on Monday morning. Oh, oh God. God. <laughs> it was, again, the only things you can do when you're 21. <laughs> I don't right. think we would have survived otherwise. I don't know how you guys, how the writing room was on Monday morning for you and Kevin, Julie. Yeah, that's rough. It's all rough. <laughs> and then she took us to the Super Bowl, which I think we've talked about too. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a couple, I feel like I've been to a couple Super Bowls with you, Nina. I don't yeah. Know. I feel like, yeah. Probably. I really liked football for a minute. <laughs> 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 oh, uh, Amazing. all right well we have to wrap but thank you all so much for being here this was so fun and for everyone listening we will be back episode three will be all about season three